Hello and welcome to TVG's Legends. I'm Todd Trump. In tonight's show, Frank Lyons sits down with Hall of Fame trainer Jack Van Berg, the winner of over 6,300 races, including the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Breeders' Cup Classic. Van Berg learned the trade from his father, Marion, a Hall of Fame trainer and owner himself. In turn, Jack has passed that knowledge to sons Tim and Tom and to other prominent trainers, such as Bill Mott and Wayne Catalano. Along the way, Van Berg also straightened out a certain Irishman named Lyons a few times. Let's join them now. Jack, welcome to Legends, and thank you for being our very first trainer that we have on Legends. Well, thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. You got involved in the horse at a very young age, Jack. Uh, tell us what it was like uh, growing up as a kid, and when did you know that there was nothing else you were going to be only a horse trainer? Well, Frank, see, my father started a livestock auction in Nebraska. And we had a livestock auction, so I was around horses, and we had, back in those days, uh, horse sales every other Monday. And so I rode horses in the auction all the time, all day long. You used to get 25 cents a head for riding them in there. And we had the thoroughbreds, the barn next to the sale barn. So I had to work over there. He made me work from the time I could, seven, eight years old, I had to work. And I thank the Lord every day that I come up on dream because he gave me great work ethic. You were very close to your dad, very, very close. We uh, were to very Marion. close, Frank, and uh, the older I got, the smarter I found out he was. You know, mm -hmm. you're a young kid, you don't want to listen to your parents, and, and uh, you know, as, as I grew up training horses and stuff, I used to think how he ever wanted to race, because, you know, you want to do things yourself, mm -hmm. but he would give you enough rope to hang yourself, mm -hmm. but then show you when you did things wrong. And, and Was he a great horseman, too? Oh, he's the greatest horseman that ever lived. He started with one horse. Led the country for 14 years, three out of the 14 in money, and uh, owned every one of them himself. He didn't really want me to be around the racetrack. He wanted me to, afraid I would get led astray. Well, and you did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I have a feeling that would have happened anywhere. <laughs> well, probably would have, right? right. <laughs> you know, he, uh, I stayed home and auctioneered. I started auctioneering. I got kicked out of college. I had an academic dismissal. Uh -huh. and, uh, I made the rodeo team, but I didn't make the... I made the Dean's List also. For a lot of the uh, people watching, they've uh, never heard of great Jack Van Berg auctioneering. So, is there any chance for about 30 seconds you could sell me a horse there? Well, I'll just sell a little something. I'll just start $100. Okay. $100. Uh huh. <laughs> like that. But uh, I started auctioneering, and probably the greatest thing is after my dad had that stroke. He passed away uh, May 3rd of 71. And uh, I come on a Saturday night, <clears throat> and I was going to come home from Exarbent. I was going to take my uh, wife and kids out to dinner, and they called me and said he wanted to see me. He kept pointing to the sail barn, and I acted like I didn't know what he wanted. But he wanted to go over there and listen to me auctioneer. Wow. And so I went over there and auctioneered two hours that Saturday night. And then he passed away on Monday. Wow. Right, but I was always thankful I did that, mm -hmm. that I did that. But mm -hmm. he was not one to give me any credit. Sure, but you knew he he'd loved tell you. you how, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he'd tell you how dumb you were. Didn't take yeah. long to do that. Yeah, well, we all have been a little dumb, you know. That. Yeah. And was he uh, pretty active in his later years as far as in the horses and stuff like that? Oh, he was. Frank, he had a stroke. I was in New Orleans racing. <clears throat> he had a stroke. And I bought a horse off of Jimmy Como. Just got him. Just let him in. come around the barn. We had a 51-stall barn at New Orleans. That horse come around the barn, and he, you had to hold that up after you had that stroke, you know, walk beside him. He'd walk. And, and he never could, he could only say two words after you had that stroke. But uh, that horse come around the corner of the barn, and he goes like this. I bought him. Never had a pimple on him. Mm -hmm. But he seen him turn that corner down there, down a 51-stall barn. And we got him up there. He went to picking them feet up, had us pick him up looking. And the horse had a quarter crack. Wow. And that, that was after when he, when he couldn't even talk. But he could, he was just a genius with horses and uh, he was a perfectionist. Yeah. Now, how old were you when you uh, got uh, your first trainer's license? And do you remember your very first win? Yeah. I was, uh, I was 15 years old, Frank, in Omaha, Nebraska. And lied about my age. Said I was 16, got a trainer's license. And uh, I had a horse called Compensator. Mm -hmm. And he won. 
So well, we move forward now and uh, talk about, like, in uh, 1968 uh, to 1986, you led the nation uh, seven times in a uh, number of wins. Tell me about, like, uh, some of those. Like, how many horses would you have, like, uh, like maximum at the time? And tell me about some of your travels. Like, Steve, as you we see Steve training, uh, you know, 500 winners in a year, starting so many horses. I mean, what kind of life is that? And you used to fly around yourself a little bit, didn't you? Well, I flew a plane. Uh -huh. I mean, I was on an airplane every other night, every third night, because I went to all my outfits. I checked them all. And where would they be, the outfits at the well, time? Well, I had horses in New York. I had horses in Detroit. Detroit was always our main division. New Orleans was the main division in the wintertime. And didn't you used to fly uh, your own plane at one stage? I did when I was in the cattle business. Fly. I used to fly in Nebraska, Colorado, yeah. Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. And it'd just be you in there? Yeah, just along. me, but I, you know, I, I, just, I didn't like it. It was very boring. I always feel like if I was going to die, I want somebody to go with me, you know. But, right. Take someone down. Yeah. <laughs> to but, feed me. Uh, I just couldn't uh, stay awake. Right. Flying. I mean, uh, I landed in uh, North Platte, Nebraska one time, and this guy came in, and he was all in the dither about, he said, oh, he said, you ain't going to believe what I did. I said, what'd you do? He said, uh, I fell asleep. I had it all on Mac Pilot, and I fell asleep. I said, well, I don't think that's bad. He said, what do you mean? I said, I fall asleep all the time. I don't even have a back pocket. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, uh, it's, it's boring up there. But not I mean, as boring for the guy who flies right by you. sees you asleep in there. Uh, what about now? In uh, 1984, you uh, came across maybe your first major, major horse and horse called a Gate Dancer, who won the Preakness. He was a very difficult horse to train. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, you know, everybody said Gate Dancer was such a rogue. Johnny Long would give the best compliment of him. He said, Jack, if I was still riding that horse, I'd never get beat. He would run up beside of a horse, and he'd, he'd lug in and lay on him, you know, when he was through making his run. If he, if he didn't let him run too quick, then he'd run on by him, you know. Right. And he was... Uh, everybody says he's crazy. He wasn't crazy. Wasn't he was crazy. a very smart horse. Now, 84 is the inception of the uh, Breeders' Cup, and in the first Breeders' Cup Classic, which no one will ever forget that race, you ran gate down. So we're going to take a look at that Classic, and then when we come back, get your comments. Now, of course, there was a disqualification. Uh, how did you feel about what happened? How did you feel after the race? Well, that was, there was a lot of controversy there. I probably think it was the worst call that the stewards have ever made. They were looking at the Herald. Wild again was laying. Cadero was trying to put Wild again and Pat Day up against the fence. Wild again was bearing out. He bore out down the backside, and he was pushing him out, and they hit my horse first and knocked his rear out from under him, and he'd come in. Frank would have to be like a bank robber. He was notorious because he got. Do you think it was because he had the, the hood on and stuff, and they thought he was no. a bit of a rogue? Maybe they were looking more at him than the others. No, because he got disqualified in Kentucky Derby. From fourth, fourth out of the Kentucky Derby, moved back. To so fifth. he kind of had they a reputation, maybe up. without deserving. That's it. right. Just like a bank robber, went straight and went mm -hmm. good, but he walked by the bank and got robbed, and they and picked him out again. A year later. Uh, again, you uh, have them in great form when you get back to the Breeders' Cup Classic, and it's the second running of the Breeders' Cup Classic. Let's see what happened this time. It's Gate Dancer in front with less than a furlong to run. Proud Truth is right at his neck. Proud Truth on the outside. Gate Dancer is game. Proud Truth ahead. Gate Dancer goes to a driving finish. Proud Truth has won it. Proud Truth got up in the final jumps to the... Looked like Jack, he was, uh, he was almost like he maybe did. did could he see uh, Proud Truth coming at him? He tried to fight back. No, I think he was, his run was over. He went to the front up the head of the lane, and he didn't need to move that quick. And, and he, if he'd have sat there and waited, you know, uh, and Proud Truth run probably the best race he ever run in his life that he day. He did, didn't he? And, uh, you know, hindsight's 20-20. If we'd have sat there and waited with him, he'd have went on. Speaking of great horses, uh, you came across a horse called Ali Sheba one time. You paid uh, 500000 for Ali Sheba, and you really weren't the kind of guy to spend a lot of money. Tell us about how you found Ali Sheba. I made a deal with Mr. and Mrs. Scarborough. They, I met him in Kentucky. Dr. Lockridge 
told him to get, me, get a hold of me, and they called me and asked me if I'd meet him in Kentucky, and I met with him, and we went to look at horses. And I just happened to see Alex Shebo standing out there. They're showing him somebody else, and they'd already looked at him. This is and Keeneland July, right? Keeneland July. And he was a light horse, kind of thin, just had been raised in the everyday rough, you know? Mm -hmm. But he just stood out, and all them alley dars were bringing a million or two million dollars. But he just stuck in my eye, just like a diamond in a rock pile. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had so much charisma to him. And, this showed, so we went back and looked at him about three different times, and they finally decided to buy him, and they bought him for 500000 mm -hmm. And uh, took him over to my farm in Kentucky that I had that training center, and started, broke him and everything, and that horse, that track had a, farm had a 5 eighths mile track, Frank. We'd pick five or six out in a set. One time around that track, 5 eighths mile, he'd be an eighth of a mile in front of everybody, just galloped, not running off. Uh, my grandmother could have galloped him. Right. He just, whatever you want him to do, he'd do. Tell us uh, a little bit about Derby Day. Were you confident that you'd win? Well, I mean, well, I, they, interviews and stuff. Uh, Chris Lincoln did interviews with me because that was his first Derby, so he still got all the interviews. And I told him, I said, there ain't no horse in there I'd trade with. Right. I said I wouldn't trade with anybody because he just got so much talent. And uh, reliving that turning for home when he stumbled. What went through your mind when he stumbled? Well, Frank, I didn't see that. Didn't. I see him swerve, but my wife's hat blew up in my face, so I didn't see again. It. She had, a big, <laughs> she had a big hat on. It. No, she didn't hit you this time. Right? And it, you know, it was in my way, and I, yeah. I didn't see that. You never I never seen it until we got to the museum after the race. Now, yeah. tell us about uh, the feeling when you hit the wire in the Kentucky Derby, and you know you've now won the Kentucky Derby. Jack, did your memories of your dad come through? Well, when I got on up on the stand with Jim McKay, went to interview me, and he asked me about my father, I bawled like a baby mm -hmm. on national TV. I mean, I cried. And, uh, because what were you thinking at that stage? Were you just proud of where you were right there? Well, sure. I was, yeah, I was very proud of where I was. Realizing that it was your dad's uh, brilliant horsemanship that wanted to pick up that foot that had the quarter crack from yeah, years ago I mean, he, that led you to that spot? That's exactly right. He taught me everything I know. Still ahead on Legends, Ali Sheba's bid for the Triple Crown and Jack's thoughts on how racing has changed in the last 50 years. That, when Legends continues. And it's Alex Sheba on the outside, along the inside, bet twice. They race to the 16th pole. Ali Sheba on the outside, bet twice at the rail. It's Ali Sheba winning the Preakness. You win the Preakness, you get on to the Belmont, and you get soundly beaten by bet twice uh, in the race. You're going for a $5 million bonus at the time. Uh, on a previous Legends show, we had Gary Stevens talked to Chris McCarran, and we talked about that Belmont and about the loss that day. Let me put it in perspective. I was a lot less nervous when my wife was getting ready to give birth to my first, my first daughter <laughs> than I was when I uh, walked into the paddock with Ali Sheba. And, uh, and I, I unfortunately succumbed to that. You know, I, I know I didn't perform at my best on that day. And it probably had, not probably, it did have a great deal to do with the pressure. Um, I learned a great lesson from that experience. And uh, I was less affected by the pressure from that point forward. It takes a, a humble man to admit that uh, he might have uh, messed up. Do you feel Chris messed up that day? Well, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, Frank. Mm -hmm. And I told Chris in the paddock that day when he came in, I said, Chris, I said, this horse will be in front every step of the way. I already told Mr. and Mrs. Carver, I said, this horse will be in front the whole race. All week long, I told him. And uh, Chris kind of looked at me a little funny, and like I fell off banana wagon or something. I mm -hmm. said, Chris, trust me, I know the horse better than the back of my hand. And uh, there's been so much talk about Klepto Clarence that should have won the Derby, Klepto Clarence should have won the Freakness. Freakness, and I think down deep maybe Chris was thinking about that horse coming and wasn't paying attention up front. Have you lingered on the fact that uh, you didn't win the Triple Crown with the horse? Well, I, I hated to see it for the horse, not for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll overcome it. I hate to see it for the horse. I don't think the horse got all the credit as good as he was. Yeah. And. Uh, a year later, when he set the track record in Woodward up there, Belmont Park set a new track record, Chris came back that day and stood up and sat. He said, Jack, you're right. He can gallop faster than they can run. Yeah. I said, Chris, you're a year late and five million short. <laughs> <laughs> but in you all know, every behind size 2020. Uh, if we went forward and went to uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic that year, that was one of the greatest races of all time, one of the greatest calls from Tom Durkin. The two derby wa uh, winners hit the wire together. Shoemaker pulled out something special that day. He, I mean, uh, 
I thought we had him. Chris, Chris thought we had him, and, uh, and Shu just always, you know, he always had a little something left, and and it was just nip and tuck. And of course, can we I take told a look at it? Yeah, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So I can cry again. Mm -hmm. And it is John Gentilucci on the outside. Kenny's going toward the rail. Ferdinand and Alex Sheba coming on from the outside. Good command is in behind horses. They're less than a foot on out. John Gentilucci desperate. Ferdinand right there. Alex Sheba on the outside. Ferdinand, John Gentilucci on the outside. Alex Sheba. Ferdinand has the lead. Alex Sheba, a final surge. The two derby winners hit the wire together. Ferdinand and Alex Sheba. Goosebumps, Jack. Yeah. Even at a loss. Yep. Yeah. How'd you feel? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he'd ran, he'd ran unbelievable that day. It was one of the greatest races I've ever seen. It's uh, a race I'll never forget. That you, uh, you thought you were beaten fair and square by a guy that you uh, thought was one of the greatest, Charlie. Charlie you know? was a great, great man. He was a great friend of mine. He was a great horseman. And the shoe. And shoe was a great, great rider. And uh, it, you know, we got beat fair and square. That's all I can tell you. But uh, it was just like I tell everybody that, that was the third time I got beaten. No, four years and the. Three of the first four Breeders' Cup Classics, you'd got beaten in those. You must yeah. have thought that uh, uh, the fellow upstairs had uh, looked down upon you when you... I when told it, everybody I had three noses from being out of debt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no doubt. But it, uh, now, uh, one more thing we'd like uh, to hear you uh, hear from great writer Chris McCarron was something else that he had to say on uh, The Legend Show when he talked to Gary Stevens. John Henry, Tis Now, Alasheba, and Precisionist going a mile and a quarter for $20 million. What about Sunday Silence? Throw Sunday <laughs> Silence in there. There's the answer. Who, <laughs> who are you going to ride? Oh, brother, who am I going to ride? Is uh, it going to be Sunday Silence? Well, I don't have to be politically correct anymore because I'm retired from riding. You. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think Ali Sheba. I, I, I think Ali. I only got to ride Sunday Silence once, and it was in the Breeders' Cup Classic. But Ali Sheba was Believe it or not, he was just getting really good when he won the Breeders' Cup Classic, and I think he was going to be an unbelievable five-year-old. We never got to see the best of that horse, Frank. Mm -hmm. never Did he retire sound, Jeff? Never had a pimple on him. Dr. Reed x-rayed him in New York, said he was the most correct, finest jointed horse he'd ever x-rayed. So now, Jack, uh, who's the best horse you ever trained? Well, I think Al Sheba, I just have, I just, he, he was the best horse I ever had. Gate Dancer was a great horse himself, and, uh, you know, he had some little quirks. Al Sheba didn't have any quirks, he just loved to beat him. And now, after that, uh, he's horse of the year. You kind of expect your year, to, uh, your career to skyrocket, but uh, it kind of didn't happen, Jack. Well, would you uh, say it went wrong? Well, I bought this ranch out here and, and got into that Built, going to build a place out here, and I got into some bad people, Frank, and I just didn't get it done, and I, I can't tell you why. I do not know why. The, my, the kick was I used to have people come to me, and they'd say, well, you got too many outfits in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't train them horses. you got too many outfits in the country. Well, the guys that are there doing the same thing nowadays that I did uh, 20 years ago. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You had guys like Bill Mott. Frankie Brothers, yeah, Wayne Catalan, Wayne Lee Catalan, Benzo, yeah. Donnie Winfrey. Don how, Winfrey, yeah. How proud are you of uh, building the careers of those uh, men? Well, I, I, that made me more happy than anything to see young guys that come to the racetrack and, and you take them. Uh, I took Wayne Catalano when he was 14 years old and uh, developed him because he was an ordinary little kid. But, and it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good when those guys go on. When Frankie won the Preakness to Belmont, you know, and with Hansel and and Billy Mott's what he's done with cigar, it, it makes you feel good, Frank. Sure, of course. Now, you've uh, been training horses for uh, over 50 years now. And nowadays, uh, Jack, uh, really, you're not really the kind of horseman you, uh, that uh, you see leading horses over. Now, they're businessmen, you know, marketers, as well as uh, horsemen. So people would sometimes say, well, the game maybe has got beyond Jack. What do you have to say about that? Well, uh, I don't, I, I don't take a back seat to nobody training the horse and keeping one sound. And I've probably forgotten more than a lot of them will ever know. And I had the best teacher in the world, the greatest teacher, Frank. But I'm not one to go. I don't like to go to the turf club and 
mm -hmm. mill around up there, and I don't like to go ask people to train horses. I, I've just never done that. If somebody mm -hmm. wants me to train a horse, they come to them. You think uh, that uh, the success of like an Ali Sheba speaks for itself, and you show them what you did when you got a little opportunity there? Yeah. You feel like you'd still do it today? I know I can. There ain't no question in my mind I can do it today. Now, uh, with over 6,300 wins, you've had an amazing amount of uh, wins. Is there one that stands out? Well, the Kentucky Derby. That's your number yeah. one. Anybody tells you it's a training horse, they don't want to win the Kentucky Derby, they're a big liar. That's all I can tell you. Any regrets of look past? Well, I was a bad family man, Frank. Bad family man. I worked, put my work in front of everything. I was fortunate enough my children all turned out good. Their mother raised them mostly. And that's the biggest regret. I just, I worked all the time. Now, you might say that you're a bad family man, but your family, Jack, to me, is uh, everyone at the racetrack. Me, when I first came over here, Brian Lynch, who we were all very close together, and you used to bring us all over to the house at uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Oh, we yeah. always had a place to go, and it wasn't where it asked, where are you going today? Well, yeah, well, you're coming to my house, and Jack could cook for all of us. We'd have 25 people over there. And uh, afterwards, you wouldn't even let us wash the dishes. And, well, we weren't in any condition to wash dishes. Then. <laughs> but uh, I remember you used to box up the food, Jack, and you'd go out and you'd drive around. What would you do with that? And tell us about a man named Steve that works for you and how you came across Steve. Well, I, uh, uh, Steve works for me. Timmy hired him. Steve had been on the streets and living on the street. And been all over the country living on the street. And old Steve always used to say, don't go to Wisconsin because they don't throw no food away up there. Mm -hmm. Timmy hired him at, at uh, Santa Anita. Tim was had an outfit for me over at Santa Anita. And I came over there that day, and Steve had that long hair. And <laughs> looked like Grizzly Adams. <laughs> I said, Tim, what are you doing? He said, well, he come here, and he needed a job. He stand out the front gate. <laughs> and he needed a job. And uh, he's, he's been the, the most dedicated person you'd ever find. He, you loved the cowboy movies, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love John Wayne. I loved, I got all his movies. Better movie, <coughs> True Grit or Brokeback Mountain? <laughs> True Grit, what's the matter with you? True Grit was a great movie. You told me you went through a whole box of tissues watching Brokeback Mountain. I didn't go to the movie, I'll okay. tell you right. Say 50 years from now, how would you like people to remember Jack Van Berg? Oh, as, a, as a good person, an honest person. And I guess a good horseman. Well, I have to echo those uh, sentiments because you're as good, honest, and as great a horseman as I've ever met. Thank you very much, Jack Thank Fenberg. you, Frank. Real pleasure. I'll offer my thoughts on JVB when Legends returns. the opportunity to ask Jack what it was like to look back at Alasheba's Derby win nearly 20 years later. Immediately, his eyes welled up with tears, just as they did on that day. And he said, when I look at that replay, I think of my dad. Jack's accomplishments in racing are not just a tribute to his father, but a validation of the son learning his lessons well. I'm Todd Shrupp for TVG's Legends. Alasheba, the front, twice. 